When I first started this essay, the idea was to talk about the parts of the villainous story concepts that I didn't like. The overused engagement breaking scene, the fact that when it's done badly, it feels like too many separate wish fulfillment fantasies tacked onto each other without care for how they interact. And the way that in exchange for making the villainous the protagonist, the only other major female character the former heroine, is simply demonized in her place, making the story the exact same as the saintess stories it was claiming to subvert, except for a swapped color palette. And sometimes, they don't even swap the color palette. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the stories that made me love this shoujo and now Jose subgenre. Specifically, I want to talk about Beware of the Villainous, Death is the Only Ending for the Villainous, and If I Could Be You for Just One Day, which has been officially translated into English with the title Your Throne. Now, I need to lay some groundwork. None of the three stories I've mentioned are part of the first wave of the shoujo villainous craze which could better be covered with stories like the currently extremely popular My Next Life as a Villainous anime, or one of the other trope originators like Common Sense of the Duke's Daughter, both of which started coming out in 2015. These stories set the stage for the two most popular branching paths of what villainous stories would be like. My Next Life as a Villainous stars Katarina Clays, affectionately nicknamed Baccarina by her fans for her extremely strong-willed and dense personality. Blending the two most common backstories into one, past memories and being an isekai from the modern world, Katarina bangs her head at the age of eight and wakes up the next morning with the memories of her past life. And more importantly, the memories her past life has of playing the Atome game Fortune Lovers, the game that she is now living in. Fearful of the consequences her villainous future self could face, exile, she thinks, or possibly even death, she decides to do two things. One, she's going to be really nice to everyone, and then on top of that, because she is genuinely a nice person, She's also going to try and help stop every single tragic backstory of any of the other main characters before they happen. And two, prepare for exile so that once her fiancé inevitably breaks up with her, she'll be in great shape even in a foreign country. A foolproof plan, only stopped by the fact that she can never manage to perceive that she's already changed the story. Katarina's story lays out the core of the villainous genre. Four to five major male leads, with the crown prince as the one she's engaged to, an engagement plotline, and the appearance of the actual heroine of the Atome game in question, who the original story once featured. What I wish more authors had also copied from My Next Life is the abundance of other female characters as well as the former heroine, but sadly they did not make it into the Xeroxed blueprints. Common Sense of a Duke's Daughter followed a completely different route, starting the very first chapter off with the moment of the engagement being broken due to the villainous being framed for bullying the heroine, Yuri. Common Sense follows Iris Elmeria, or, well, the young Japanese office lady who has become Iris Elmeria as of that moment, as she engages in what the plot summary calls major positive changes to the kingdom, and I simply call inventing capitalism. She's also involved once again in the struggle for the throne, as it turns out the prince who dumped her had an older brother, who, unbeknownst to her for quite some time, is acting as her butler for much of the series. I don't actually like this story, but I didn't stop reading it for any of the things I just mentioned above. I just don't like it when they portray a series as girl empowerment, 
then go out of the way to show her love interest smoothing things out for her behind the scenes without her knowledge. Drives me crazy. Anyway, with the success of both of these series came waves and waves of knockoffs. Light novels that became manga in the same manner as both of these, light novels that never became manga, original manga series that based itself off the same conceit. It was a boom among shoujo authors that still persists to this day, and will likely only continue due to the recent mainstream success of My Next Life as a Villainous, All Roots Lead to Doom. Skipping ahead in time to 2017 and 2018, we come to some of the first Korean villainous manhwa to gain traction with a wider audience. Miss Not So Sidekick, The Justice of Villainous Women, and Survive as the Hero's Wife. Miss Not So Sidekick follows Latte Ektri, formerly known as Kim Hyung, who woke up one day in the body of a minor villain of her favorite romance novel. Instead of being fearful of her fate, Latte is instead excited to be able to witness her favorite romance moments play out firsthand. However, things are very confusing for her. Not only are things slightly different, but the main heroine, herself, appears to be acting... strange? Miss Not-So-Sidekick's main contribution to the alteration of the normal villainous story is in the choice to have the main love interest not be the crown prince, but instead one of the other male leads. In this case, the mysterious mage character. While you could say it was also original to have the former female lead act as an antagonist, sadly that's straight from common sense of the duke's daughter. The idea of the formerly saint-like female lead transforming into another isekai who acts entitled to things without the niceness of the character they are replacing is unfortunately extremely common. It's most unfortunate, however, due to the fact that often the script has been flipped without care for the wider implications. There's nothing interesting or progressive about the lady born into wealth and privilege winning a social fight against someone from a far lower social class who is doing everything she can to work her way up. Justice of the Villainous Woman follows a young woman named Huayong who falls into a river after her boyfriend breaks her heart, dies, and wakes up in the body of infamous villainess Satyana Kalon. Competing to be the future queen against her rival, Irene, Satyana ends up realizing that they are both being forced to hide behind masks in order to gain the support of the populace and the prince, but that her mask includes being rude, whereas Irene's picture of ideal serenity leaves no room for any slippage, and she uses that to her advantage to match wits with her and eventually gain the love of the prince in the kingdom. The lasting legacy of this series is that of one that managed to confirm one of the flaws of its genre, the fact that the villainess is actually operating from a place of advantage, without ever treating this like a flaw of the story. After all, did people not come here to see the villainess win? The last of the first wave is Survive as the Hero's Wife, starting a new take on the genre that is about to be copied to hell and back. But before addressing the story, Let's talk about the fashion. One of the criteria I used when deciding which works I thought counted as villainous enough to be included in this essay was the style of dress of the protagonist. If, for example, she was constantly dressed in the over-the-top jewelry and jewel tones of a well-off antagonist. And many of the villainous that appear, well, they don't. I understand that not dressing like a villainess seems to be a strange criteria next to the two other ones I just listed, but an integral part of the villainous wish fulfillment fantasy includes the idea of dressing outside of the shoujo protagonist's angelic pastel norm. Fashion is a huge part of shoujo and jose comics, and part of the popularity of the villainous character is that the author can constantly put her in beautiful, red, purple, and even black dresses 
without it violating the shoujo protagonist's pale pink and blue of humbleness and humility. It's a worrying trend that this part of the villainous genre seems to be becoming optional. Canaria Easter is the secondary antagonist of their original setting, an impoverished noble lady who was manipulated and used by the main antagonist, the Empress, as a tool against the man she married, who'd go on to be the lead of the entire romance novel. She's also, of course, become the Isekai villainous protagonist. And one more thing, in the original story, the man who kills her is, of course, that same male lead, her husband. Due to the fact that this is an isekai story and not a second life memory story, this is still something I'm reasonably okay with. While the threat hangs over her, this isn't, in fact, the man that cheated on her, that killed her, the story lead. That story never played out, never happened. But in Abandoned Empress, a story that follows an eerily similar plotline all the way from engaged to the crown prince, marries him, becomes empress, killed by him for perceived disloyalty after he falls in love with another woman, is. It's even worse. The main character gets back together with the crown prince despite her experiencing constant trauma and even so far as having flashbacks whenever she's in the same room with him for large parts of the series. Writing stories where a woman remarries someone who never loved her, who hurt or even killed her, only to discover that in this life, the life where she's more gentle or more distant or just more something, that in this life he loves her, will never be a good setup. It can't be because the real world implications are too horrifying. And victim blaming. The idea that it's you who needs to change to be lovable, to be deserving of love, instead of the male lead, is an awful message to be sending to the target audience of Shoujo and Jose. Girls and women as young as 8 and as old as 45. With all that established, let's talk about the stories I love. First published in 2019, Beware of the Villainous stars Melissa Podebrandt, a Korean college student who was caught in a car crash and ended up stuck in the world of a novel she'd once read, but had never finished because she'd hated it so much. That novel followed a format that only seemed so blatantly stereotypical because of the way that Melissa lays it out in the first chapter. A young, angelic girl named Yuri, yes, the same as the one from Common Sense of the Duke's Daughter, who's adopted by a baron after her talent with light magic was noticed, becomes the target of affection from the four major romance candidates, the crown prince, who Melissa is betrothed to, a stoic and silent sniper character, who is Melissa's older brother, a wolfman and a billionaire merchant who both have separate antagonist relationships with Melissa. The comedic escalation of the twists and turns necessary to justify how they know the designated villainous only works as satire due to the knowledge that many villainous novels really do just go for it. Yes, this secondary antagonist does know every single plot relevant character and has since childhood. Don't worry about it. However, this is just basic comedic satire. The real heart of Melissa's story comes from one very important choice on her part. The idea that Yuri, the original protagonist, deserves better than to end up with a single one of the male leads. There is nothing good about being desired by a playboy prince who pursues you while his fiance watches, Melissa says, and it's not Yuri's fault. There's nothing romantic about being stalked by a loner. It's gross and it's creepy. There's nothing fun about being flirted with while the threat of kidnapping hangs over your head and the prevalence of male leads, like the billionaire, whose every romantic line is encoded with the idea of the heroine as an object to be possessed, owned, 
trapped. Yuri has given up on ever being able to escape her own story, her own cycle of mistreatment, the same story beats repeating over and over and over. But Melissa hasn't. First published in 2020, Death is the only ending for the villainous, also known as Villains Are Destined to Die, makes no attempt at being a comedy. The protagonist, a young woman in the midst of celebrating her recent acceptance to college and her escape from her abusive family, finds herself trapped in the Atome game she'd been playing the night before, in the body of the villainess she had been so sympathetic to, due to sharing that same trauma. Not only is she trapped in the hard root of a game notorious for killing its protagonist when you choose the wrong option, Penelope Eckhart is stuck in the exact same situation she thought she'd just escaped from. Once more trapped in a house with a father and two brothers who despise her. And this time, there's no college to escape to. No, Penelope only has one way out. Raise the affection level of one of the five capture targets all the way to 100%. Her starting percentages, 0%, negative 10%, 0%, 0%. Penelope's escape being so explicitly and visibly tied to the affection of men she doesn't like and who have an extreme level of power over her day-to-day -day life and overall fate makes a common undercurrent of villainous novels and shoujo trends in general incredibly clear. The idea that love is the escape from powerlessness is incompatible with the idea that all power is coming from the influence of powerful men. She has to earn their affection to escape, but earning their affection comes at a personal cost to her. Being around either of her brothers reminds her of both their mistreatment and her own previous abuse. Being around the magician reminds her of how unreliable the people she needs the most are. Being around her freed slave reminds her of how she can't even guarantee the safety of those she wants to be safe. And being around the crown prince makes her genuinely fear for her life. She'll die if she can't get the affection meter to 100. But in the most dramatic part of season one, decides it's worth it. It's worth it to tank the one thing that could get her out of here in exchange for being angry, for being rude, for being publicly despairing. She will get out of here, but she also can't stand for this. She'll make this world treat her better. Also published in 2020, Your Throne has two leads, Medea Solon and Psyche Callista. Psyche is the saintess of the story and Medea the villainess. They were the two standouts during the competition for the hand of the crown prince and Psyche won. Things come to a head as Medea plunges into the sacred waters of the church with one wish in her heart. I should have been the one, she screams at the unknown god. I should have been the one, not Psyche. And her wish is heard. Your Throne is a body swap novel where Medea and Psyche switch places. Now in Psyche's body, Medea has to contend with the fact that the life she thought Psyche had was so much worse than she could have imagined while Psyche herself comes face to face with the cold, desperate realities that have driven Medea all her life. Overall, the story relies on both of the female leads understanding that they came from places of hardship and suffering, and were both lied to by the same man. The same man, Psyche's fiance, who wants them dead. Since this is not an isekai narrative, there's no charming fourth wall break where the point of view character stops to be like, this is the fate of the villainess, or this was the most popular male lead, although. 
Also due to the focus on Medea and Psyche, there's simply less room for the full 4-5 to five male lead characters that the genre is known for. In fact, there's only two with a strong presence in the story at all. Eros Vasilius, the crown prince, who appears to harbor an ardent love of Psyche, and Helio Nicolo, Medea's main supporter and confidant. So, what's the problem? Medea has what she wants now, after all. She's Psyche, the fiancé of the crown prince. The world is in her hands. But she had no story to warn her that she wouldn't be happy at all. While Beware the Villainous is a comedic satire with dramatic moments, and Death is the only ending a drama with occasional lightheartedness, Your Throne has the pounding tension of a thriller. Lies upon lies, and all the power in the world concentrated in the hands of one single abusive liar who will do anything to make the power of miracles fall solely into his own hands. Unless Medea and Saki can band together, neither of them will ever attain freedom. And that, of course, is why your throw is so good. The underlying core theme of these novels is a simple thread. The suffocating layer of misery that comes from being reliant on the power of others that can easily be lost simply through saying the wrong thing. But more importantly, that it is possible to survive and thrive through building connections with other people who are also suffering. Melissa's choice to defend both Yuri and Nine from the terrible things in their past are what help her enjoy her presence. Penelope finds her courage through solidarity with her newly freed knight, and Medea finds that experiencing Psyche's life has mostly shown her one very important thing, that they both deserve so much better than this. That is the part of the villainous stories I'll never tire of. Hi, I'm Zar, and this is my channel for discussing anime, animation, and various storytelling devices. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. See ya!